Sydney. Um, welcome to, the, to today's webinar on TTIP 2.0 and regulatory cooperation, what lobbyists and regulators have in store for us. So this webinar is on the currently ongoing US-EU uh, negotiations. Um, before I go into a few more details content-wise, I would like to make a few technical remarks. Um, first of all, I would like to say that this webinar takes one hour. We have two inputs of 10 minutes and after these inputs, we have five minutes for questions of clarification. During these five minutes, please use the chat to ask questions, right? Uh, only use the chat in the five minutes of, for questions of understanding. And we, after our inputs, we'll have a, a discussion and more time for debate. Um, and during this time, please um, ask your questions either via the chat or you can ask them live uh, and I put you live if you raise your hand. You have to raise your hand or ask your questions via the chat in the second part of the webinar. Is that clear? Please raise your hands if that's clear for you. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Final remark I have is that this webinar is being recorded, uh, so please be, be aware of this, that. I hope this is okay for everyone. Okay. So we are in the webinar on TTIP 2.0 and regulatory uh, cooperation. This webinar consists of two parts. Part one will take place today and it's on the threats to democracy of the current on currently ongoing negotiations between the US and uh, the EU. We have two excellent speakers, Laura Grosse who works with lobby control and Alessa Hartmann who works with PowerShift. Alessa will go first and talk about regulatory cooperation uh, in general and its threats to democracy, whereas Laura will speak on uh, the specifics of the currently ongoing negotiations between the US and the EU. Um, next week, the, the second part of the webinar takes place and is primarily on the lobby attacks on protection levels. We have two excellent speakers too. Uh, one from the US, Sharon Treat from the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy and Kenneth Ha from Corporate Europe Observatory from the European side. So please put this in your diaries next Wednesday, the 27th at 5 p.m. same time, uh, Central European time uh, like today. Okay, um, content wise, uh, we have the ongoing uh, negotiations between the US and EU, who, which take place uh, more and more in secret. Uh, we had a few moves uh, towards more transparency in trade policy after all the critique during the CETA and the TTIP negotiations, but we have uh, uh, actually uh, gone back to intransparent negotiations uh, uh, in, like actually in the US it has been uh, all the time. So uh, Phil Hogan hasn't been uh, <laughs> keen on advancing transparency in trade policy. Um, we are not currently talking about a huge mandate like TTIP uh, was, but rather about a limited mandate for conformity assessment um, that that uh, that Laura will discuss later. But we will we, we will see during today's session, but also next week, how the the corporate agenda has still found its way into uh, these ongoing negotiations. And to to get started into the issue, I would uh, like to give Alessa the floor to to make a uh, few remarks on regulatory cooperation in general. Alessa. Yes, hello everybody. I'm Alessa from PowerShift. I'm working um, there in the field of trade and investment policy. And I will share my um, presentation now with you. 
I hope this will work. Um, okay. So, um, if you don't see my presentation marks, then just give me a sign. <laughs> um, so the title of today's webinar is Regulatory Cooperation in TTIP 2.0. Threats to democracy and why regulatory cooperation threatens our democracy is uh, what I want to talk about to you today. And in my presentation, I want to explain the main points of criticism we see. Uh, this is about my organization, but now it starts. So, what is regulatory cooperation? Um, trade agreements of the so called newer generation aim to eliminate non tariff uh, trade barriers. So what are non-tariff trade barriers? They are um, different specifications on production processes and product standards, health and safety rules, or permitted ingredients in food. Uh, these uh, hinder trade um, as they are usually more cost intensive for producers and traders. Uh, however, um, these are our high protection uh, standards um, for the benefit of consumers or the environment. So one mechanism to remove these non-tariff trade barriers is regulatory cooperation. And the aim uh, of regulatory cooperation is to identify differences in national legislation, regulation standards and test procedures, so um, that could have a negative impact on trade. Um, these should be minimized or completely eliminated. And roughly speaking, there are three ways uh, in which this can be implemented, and I have put them in the presentation. The first is harmonization, so the agreement on common standards, then um, mutual recognition, uh, standards and procedures of the other side are accepted as equivalent, and um, thirdly, simplification, simplification of procedures and standards. So in trade agreements, so most recent EU trade agreements either have a separate chapter on regulatory cooperation or provisions on regulatory cooperation can be found in, in a cross-sectional manner in all articles. For example, um, CETA, JEFTA, the USMCA and the suspended TTIP, they have um, a dedicated regulatory cooperation chapter, but they also have um, regulatory cooperation in all the other articles. Um, the Mercosur Agreement, for example, also has a chapter on regulatory cooperation and the uh, later the agreements on Vietnam and Singapore, they have um, not a dedicated chapter, but um, um, provisions on regulatory cooperation in all their other chapters. So it's um, something the EU is quite keen on. Our critique, uh, first of all, the lack of transparency. Not surprisingly, <laughs> uh, the work of the committees that are um, uh, doing um, the work of the regulatory cooperation takes place almost exclusively in secret. The minutes of these meetings are not published or they are blacked out and public reports are very much incomplete. It's very difficult to find any information um, on the work of these uh, committees that are doing the regulatory cooperation of the trade agreements. Secondly, um, the difference between the scientific risk-based principle and the precautionary principle. So um, probably you already know this, but uh, the conditions for regulations um, between, the, between Europe and other countries like, for example, the US or Canada are fundamentally different. In Europe, the precautionary principle applies, and this means that the producer of a product must prove that it is not harmful to the environment and consumer before it is put on the market. In other countries like the US or Canada, it is practically more or less the other way around. Um, public institutions must prove that a product is harmful in order to ban it and to withdraw it from the market. This is called risk-based or science-based um, approach. And as you um, may know, combining these two different approaches is a huge challenge. And to do this without lowering or weakening standards, it seems very much unlikely and at least very risky for our um, high uh, standards. So the early warning system for regulatory changes. Um, regulatory cooperation and trade agreement gives the EU and uh, the other country, I will take the example of CETA now because this is uh, an agreement that has already been implemented 
at the moment. Um, so it gives EU and Canada the opportunity to get involved in legislative processes at a very early stage. For example, in the CETA Treaty, it states that each party shall, whenever appropriate, gives consideration to the regulatory measures or projects of the other party on the same or related issues. Um, this means that one party can uh, comment on the proposals or even question them. And um, this means that the EU would have to consider Canadian regulatory proposals before they are submitted to the European Parliament or the Council. Um, at the same time, Canada or the EU can also ask um, the other country to recognize a regulator as equivalent to its own. And um, should the EU or Canada refuse to do so, it would have to, to provide so-called justified reasons and will thus come under pressure to justify itself. And this can delay, soften, or even prevent important regulations on consumer or environmental protection and weakens the efficiency of regulatory processes. Um, another very uh, important issue in this is that the early warning system means that corporate lobbyists are also informed very timely and can then use the criteria to quickly raise objections to proposed legislation. I will come to this, uh, I'll come back to this uh, later on. Um, the impact assessments. It's not in the um, CETA text, as I recall it, but for example, in the plan TTIP. For um, the frozen TTIP impact assessment reports were foreseen at that time. And um, this means a trade impact assessment of any regulatory, regulatory project, both at national and EU level. Um, the so-called regulatory impact assessment is designed to measure impact of legislation, particularly on trade and investment. Um, coordination with US regulators was also planned. And as I said before, a regulatory project that may hinder trade um, or make it more expensive may at the same time be a very high standard of protection that is under pressure. So this is also um, a point of critique we see. I have already uh, mentioned um, the implementing bodies, the councils and committees. So this is uh, how regulatory cooperation works in practice. Uh, maybe let me take the example of CETA again. The European Canadian Agreement is kept alive by its extensive committee uh, system. This is uh, the AR responsible for implementing the agreement. But also, and this is uh, the real democratic political scandal for developing, uh, changing and supplementing the agreement. So in plain language, this means um, that CETA can develop into an agreement that many parliamentarians did not agree to. Um, however, they will not be consulted after the one-time ratification they have done, for example, in the European Parliament. The committees consist of Canadian and European officials from the respective ministries, uh, DGs and state authorities. Um, but not only them will participate, uh, extensive consultation with stakeholders, and this means lobbyists from major, major corporations are also in. And um, so they can be called in as experts for meetings and consultations. I also have an example on um, the dangers of uh, these committees. And this comes back to the explosive nature of the living agreement that I have mentioned before. It is particularly evident in the possibility for the committees to amend the provisions in the annexes, in the annexes of the agreements. This means de facto that the agreement is no longer what members of parliament and government and the council have agreed to when the committees are doing changes to the annexes. For example, amending something or also taking something out. And they have the possibility to do so. Um, as I mentioned before, a very important point for us is um, the corporate lobby. Uh, company representatives are given privileged access to the working groups and can influence the design of future regulations before um, elected parliamentarians seize them because they are in the working groups and parliamentarians are not. <laughs> um, for corporations, it is especially important that regulations are not trade restrictive and too expensive to implement. So the safety of consumers and the environment um, is certainly not their top priority, as you can imagine. Um, 
I've put down uh, some examples. So what the interests of corporate lobbyists are, uh, they made very clear during the consultation of the CETA Forum for Regulatory Cooperation in 2018. This is also where I got this quote that you are seeing now from. What they uh, uh, want are maximum levels for residues of pesticides and veterinary drugs, the approval of GMOs, and for example, uh, grain deliveries, and um, they criticize very much the non-scientific nature of the European precautionary principle that I've mentioned before. Yeah, the quotation you see there is from the Canola Growers Association. They criticize that in, that in its opinion, there's too little regulatory cooperation between the EU and Canada in the field of agricultural biotechnology. And a more efficient EU approval process would provide much needed investment security for life science companies and give both sides stable access to innovative biotechnology. So this means they want more GMOs. <laughs> Uh, I've put another a very long um, quote um, from Cereals Canada, and that is the Canadian Grain Industry Associations, and they um, also relate uh, to the an article in TTIP, um, as you can read. Um, they are stressing that the EU regulatory and policy framework for approval of biotechnology trades, so it's also going in the direction of GMOs creates uncertainty among Canadian farmers' uh, access to market and the industri industry's ability to commercialize biotech innovations. They also complain that the EU regulatory and policy framework for the approval of biotechnology trades, so GMOs, creates uncertainty yeah, for them. Alessa, please come to an end. Soon. Yeah, I'm nearly done. And uh, this is my conclusion. <laughs> And um, yes, as I've uh, already said, the, um, our main criticism is uh, that the work of the committees is carried out almost exclusively in secret, so transparent, lack of transparency is a big issue. Then um, the different approaches to regulations that make cooperation very much difficult without it being at the expense of the environment and consumers. Then the impact assessments with cost-benefit analysis of regulations that we see as a very big problem. Then um, the problem that contracting parties can participate in the legislative processes at very early stage and um, other stakeholders are not allowed, like for example, parliamentarians. Then that the committees are open to corporate lobbyists. And um, yeah, to stay with the committees, they have very much extensive powers, for example, to amend annexes of the trade agreements. And this is, uh, I think, really crucial because this is undermining parliamentary standards. Um, changes to trade agreements that have already been ratified by parliaments um, and then changed. Uh, yes, and then in the end, this leads uh, to the problem that regulatory de uh, decisions. Um, it could be made more difficult to um, reverse them and further development of regulation could be hindered and standards can be frozen. And this is my conclusion and I hope uh, an introduction to regulatory cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this excellent outline of regulatory cooperation in EU trade agreements, Alessa. Um, we have now five minutes time for questions of clarification. There was already one question asked, um, which is of a general nature, which was uh, if we share the presentations uh, after our webinar, uh, I think this will be the case. I think there will be a follow up email with material and the presentations. So no worry about that. More questions of clarification to Alessa. Please ask them via the chat. No questions coming up from our participants. It seems everybody uh, was completely speechless. convinced and speechless. <laughs> okay, great, excellent. I give you one more second to think about it. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So then we will proceed with our second speaker, Laura, Laura Große. She will speak on the currently ongoing US-EU negotiations and the specific mandate on conformity assessment. Laura, 
The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, I've been experiencing some problems throughout the day with my uh, laptop, but I hope it will carry me through the input at least. Um, let me just share my screen. Yeah, in a bit. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. I'm sorry, I can't put it in proper presentation mode since that wouldn't allow me to uh, see my notes. And then I could uh, mostly speak only about what you see on the on the screen. Um, yeah, Alessa just paved the way with her excellent input um, into, into the concept and overall problem with regulatory cooperation. Um, and I think gave some great examples um, to what that can lead. Um, and now we want to go for a closer examination um, of regulatory cooperation and the, the efforts that the Commission and its counterpart in the US are making uh, in this new round of negotiations. Um, as well as the changes that have been introduced to the concept, both to the envisaged type of regulatory cooperation, the type of activity, um, as well to the uh, as well as to the way that the commission is communicating those plans, um, which has also um, been modified over the last couple of years. Um, for a quick recap, um, as many of you will recall, especially the years 2015 and 16 saw some vivid protests, but waves of protests both in the EU and to some lesser extent in the US. Um, this in combination with um, Donald Trump winning the um, US presidential elections in 2016 um, led to a yeah, stalemate or even, even, even a preliminary death of the negotiations and for some time it looked as um, though negotiations on a concrete agreement would not take off in the foreseeable future. Um, but especially against the background of the ongoing tariff conflict um, that has been um, particularly uh, bad for, for EU producers um, and exporters, exporting industries. Um, this, um, yeah, this, this, this situation has required um, that the two will start talking again and uh, a new round of talks uh, and negotiations was launched in 2018 um, when then president of the commission uh, Juncker and Trump appeared um, for, for, for a statement declaring a new round of, of trade talks. Um, I think the, the, the term negotiations never popped up until um, the the formal launch in uh, April 2019, um, which also is one means to uh, defer attention from the talks to uh, make any uh, any um, proximity to to TTIP um, at least in the discussion um, appear uh, disappear. Um, yeah, because as I said. Uh, with the, 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 the kind of protest that um, the commission experienced with TTIP, they of course want to avoid in this new kind of uh, new round of negotiations. But nevertheless, uh, regulatory cooperation also plays a central role um, in this new round of negotiations, albeit in a, a different manner than was foreseen in TTIP that had a very uh, large horizontal chapter on regulatory cooperation um, uh, in mind, um, but 
already in the joint statement back in 2018, um, we saw our first glimpse of the of the plans that are there now. Um, when uh, the two declared that they will work to reduce barriers and uh, and increase trade, um, and uh, we're going to uh, uh, launch a dialogue on stand on standards in order to ease trade. Um, reduce bureaucratic obstacles and and uh, slash costs. Um, this this reducing bureaucratic obstacles or um, non tariff um, obstacles to to trade, um, which Alessa already mentioned, um, is uh, or is mainly uh, to be seen as as um, uh, a slang for for regulatory cooperation towards um, either the simplification, harmonization, or mutual recognition of standards. Um, and uh, although the Commission has downplayed the ambitions from the start, um, there were several mentions of regulatory cooperation uh, in the course of the trade talks. Um, as we first saw in an interim report of the so-called Executive Working Group in January 2019, um, that first mentioned uh, the plans for official negotiations on an agreement uh, on conformity assessment, but also um, spoke about dialogues that should take place, but outside of um, the scope of, of any trade negotiations, although it has never been specified in which shape this dialogue would come to be. Um, Shortly after the council had uh, given the green light to the to the start of the negotiations in uh, 2019, um, the commission launched a call for stakeholder proposals on regulatory cooperation activities um, in in three areas. Um, again, only one of which is. Uh, mentioned in the mandate or has a particular mandate, um, uh, which is conformity assessment, of course. But then once more, there pops up this ominous dialogue on standards and again, um, the, the call to, to send in proposals for regulatory cooperation in sectors, um, also not, not covered by either um, the joint statement um, Explicitly uh, or in the in the in the mandate um, that was launched uh, that was passed to the Commission to negotiate an agreement. Um, yeah, the the the, the centerpiece of the official trade negotiations where um, the Commission has a mandate and uh, we now have also texts to analyze um, concerns conformity assessment. Um, conformity assessment is, uh, you could call it some a form of low level or more low level, at least it, it was envisaged, envisaged in the um, uh, formative negotiations. Um, is a form of, of low-level regulatory cooperation that aims to remove, as I said, non-tariff trade barriers. Uh, in this case, um, a mostly different uh, product admission procedures, um, like testing requirements, um, um, for example, what kind of um, ISO norm uh, has to be, uh, has to be, or to what, to what ISO norm a product has to conform, um, the kind of uh, standards it has to adhere to, but also uh, what kind of um, agencies or uh, bodies um, are allowed to conduct testing processes and accreditation processes um, of conformity assessment bodies, as it is called in the US um, mostly. And this can include a very wide range of, 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 um, of processes um, that might be directly or indirectly used to determine that the requirements um, are met. Um, yes. Um, this issue, like many things, is regulated very differently in the US, uh, which is 
partly due um, to the the overall approach to to risk assessment and and uh, um, quality assessment processes that Alessa um, has already mentioned mostly um, captured in the um, in the in the in the terms precautionary principle um, and what the U.S. is calling a science-based risk approach um, or hazard-based approach. Um, where testing is conducted um, mostly in cases when uh, or, or after after a product has been launched um, to the market, um, contrary to, um, to to processes where um, the harmlessness of a product has to be proven before market launch. Um, in this particular case regarding conformity assessment, there's Another um, problem that I will speak about in a second, um, just to give you one quick insight into what the commission is actually allowed to negotiate. Um, you can um, derive that from the, 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 the mandate or the directives for the negotiations that was passed by the council, um, which states that um, the objective of the negotiation is to facilitate trade uh, through the development of streamlined processes to ease the recognition of conformity assessment results that confirm compliance of products with the party's technical regulations whilst ensuring that a high level of protection in the EU, EU is fully preserved. Um, this, this, this kind of disclaimer is very common uh in, in 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 yeah more current um trade agreements although um it doesn't it doesn't necessarily um has binding consequences in the in the text themselves um and at the same in the same uh uh textual proposal the eu um is stating that uh, mutual recognition um, of products is not uh, an objective of the treaty or of the, the agreement. Um, but of course, when uh, providing for mutual recognition of specific um, testing procedures, um, then this will also lead to, to uh, lesser surveillance um, of the products themselves in the end. Um, yeah, just to to briefly get into more concrete problems with the with the text, um, there are mostly three. Um, one uh, con concerns the scope uh, of the agreement. Um, there's it, it includes already a quite broad range of products from um, technical, electronic, electrical equipment to toys, uh, to motorboats, um, but uh, leaves considerable way uh, to amend those categories um, without um, putting uh, uh, an exact threshold on the kind of, of, of products you can um, include except for uh, um, a note to the um, WTO's um, technical bar barriers to trade and uh, sanitary and uh, SPS agreement. Um, so there is considerable way to, to, to um, extend the categories of products that are included in the agreement. Um, this is also related to um, a so-called joint committee that the, the, the EU proposal um, foresees, um, which, um, as, as Alessa also already mentioned, is a common um, kind of body that is put into agreements uh, like this, charged with uh, organizing uh, the, the regulatory cooperation activities um, which means um, the composition of um, the, the, the committees that uh, are looking at a certain regulatory proposal. Um, and in this case, the joint committee has 
the power to amend the, the scope of the agreement um, and uh, has also the, the, the power to uh, um, define its own procedures, its own uh, kind of workflows. There's also, it lacks um, a clear definition on how this, this committee should be con constituted. Um, it, the only mention there is, is of uh, two uh, uh, executives from, from, from the Commission and the uh, USDR um, respectively, um, but it doesn't say if external expertise can be uh, included in such a committee's work, which would be, uh, which would mean that an, a general openness to, to lobby input or stakeholder input. Uh, it also doesn't say if um, members of the committee um, sh should should only be trade regulators, either either from DG Trade or the USTR. So there's a lot of uh, unclarity in that in that. Proposal. Please come to an end soon. Yes, I will for the time being. Then I will skip the part about first party conformity assessment because that's a kind of uh, more more technical um, thing. There's, an, there's a second problem, overall problem, that is not related to the text themselves, um, but uh, to the manner that the Commission has been conducting um, the negotiations. Um, as you might know, um, as a response to the massive protests against um, TTIP, CETA and such, um, a couple of years back it introduced a trade for all policy. Um, that, amongst other things, defined a certain level of transparency and uh, provisions that uh, were supposed to um, ensure greater exchange with uh, all interested stakeholders, not only um, powerful and, 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 and uh, yeah, lobby groups equipped with the, with the right uh, financial resources, um this kind of policy uh, has been completely forgotten or so it seems with with um, this new new round of trade talks um we don't see any uh, negotiation round reports as has been practiced in the past um the reports that are available are with very little informational value um we don't know who the commission is meeting um yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, things have have kind of uh, degraded uh, for the worse, especially since uh, the new commissioner Phil Hogan uh, took office last fall. Um, where at least my assessment would be that that exchange with with uh, civil society or the more with Corona has been decreased significantly. Also, the objectives of the talks are not fully clear. There are a lot of mentions of energy uh, and of agriculture in the in the uh, several appearances of commission members, um, of DG Trade members. Um, there were talks that the uh, commission was going to lower um, or was was open to concessions uh, in in the field of agriculture, which um, is uh, not covered by the mandates for good reasons. Because, uh, for example, France um, is strongly against an inclusion of agriculture in the agreement with the US. Um, yeah. Uh, the third big problem that we see oh, something. Uh, Please come to an end soon. <laughs> yes, I will. Um, as, as, as Alessa already mentioned, regulatory cooperation is something that lobby groups um, have been pushing for for quite some time. Um, we see in the in the uh, consultation documentation, uh, both by the US and the US, uh, the EU. Um, that it's still high up in the wish list um, and remarks by, by commission members such as uh, Hidu Hogan, who you see on the picture there, um, who stated uh, that, that the DG Trade was uh, an honest fork on the business community's behalf and uh, um, depended on their proposals on regulatory cooperation is really not a good sign in that context. And um, 
is something that we have to actively fight against in the future, I would say. Um, this would be it so much from my part. I overextended my speaking time. Thank you a lot. And if any questions, please come forward. And also just a small hint that this, especially this last, um, uh, this last uh, area concerning the inclusion of agriculture, how the how lobby groups, especially from the U.S., have been uh, pushing um, for 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 a lower standards in the EU, and uh, how the Commission is making those concessions or could make them, would be also um, part of next week's webinar. Thank you very much uh, for this deep and insightful presentation, Laura. Now we have 15 minutes for, for questions. Um, you can ask them either live or via the chat. The floor is to everyone. <laughs> No questions at all. Alessa? Yeah, if uh, nobody else has a question, I have a question <laughs> to Laura. Um, if you just have uh, some time left, maybe you could say something about this first party conformity assessment you mentioned and you have not talked about yet. Sorry, I was muted. Um, First party conformity assessment is something that has been uh, uh, widely popular in the EU since the, um, I think it was called new regulatory framework introduced in 2006 that aimed at harmonizing um, EU regulation and products that uh, were manufactured according to different standards in different countries. and to um, yeah, to, as an incentive, very high incentive for, for manufacturers to adhere to the commonly defined um, uh, standards was to introduce self-declaration of conformity by uh, the manufacturers. Um, like you probably are familiar with the little CE label and this label that you often find on electrical, electronical equipment um, can be put on the product by the manufacturer declaring conformity with a standard set up for a certain type of or category of product without the need um, to have prior testing uh, for conformity on the EU market. Um, the the respective authorities or agencies can step in and uh, request documentation that the conformity assessment process has been conducted by the manufacturer, but this is not um, foreseen prior to market launch. We have questions coming in now. There's one I would rather point to Alessa, which is uh, uh, if the RECOP committee uh, in the CETA agreement has already been working, is it set up? Maybe you can answer this question quickly. Question by Linda Korsha. Yes, um, they've been set up and they are working. Um, they're meeting, I think, once or twice a year. And um, there are official reports available at the um, EU Commission's website about these meetings, but these are very, um, these are not going into deep uh, so that the real reports are not available. So they are secret and um, yeah. So we don't really know what, what they are talking about in the meetings. Yeah, and there's a second question. Um, are there any documents for recent regulatory cooperation talks or are they, are they all completely in secret? Uh, I think that's a question you can both answer. Well, the third is directly to Laura, maybe. Who wants to go? Um, I, I, I just can... Um... I repeat what I said um, about CETA um, because I'm following this one the most and um, there, 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 there are reports available on the website of the EU Commission but they are not 
not the real, not what they keep, what they are really talking about. And um, there has been one leak by um, the Council of Canadians and Food Watch Netherlands of um, a report of the SPS committee of CETA. Um, and they got one by via an, an um, freedom of inter information request. They got one real report of a meeting, and uh, it's like um, some hundreds of pages long, and it's quite uh, informative. But uh, some parts are blacked, so it's not very easy for I would say normal um, people to get in information about these meetings. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, please try to be brief in your answers because we have more questions coming in now. This one is to Laura. I feel, I've heard that the European Commission has a lack of staff. Couldn't that be a reason for more meetings with business interest group to somehow outsource work that used to be done by the Commission, it's two interest groups? If that is the case, how would you assess this? Um... I, I think, um, or it's very possible that the, the European institutions overall are understaffed. Um, but I, I think that um, this, I mean, expertise from the outside is uh, is legit. You can you can always um, uh, ask stakeholders for input, and we have the expertise in a certain field. Uh, but if the processes that you set up for that uh, will systemically um, give advantage to lobby groups with a lot of money, uh, with the finance and resources, um, then this will, of course, mute other interests such as NGOs um, fighting for more, um, yeah, common good. Um, so I think if if it's a, if it's imbalanced access of interest groups is not something that can be explained away with with understaffed. Okay, thanks. And here's a question for either speaker by Michael Rainsborough uh, to comment on the UK uh, US trade negotiations and their impact to pressure on the EU to change or triangulate their negotiating positions. Any thoughts on that? And who wants to go? Um, can, can, can you? I can repeat the question, yes, of course. Uh, the, the question is whether the trade negotiations of the UK with the US will have an uh, will put pressure up on the EU to change or triangulate their negotiation positions. Um, this is this has been our fear for the last couple of months, at least, that um, by, I mean, by now waves of punitive tariffs coming in from the US and an overall, um, yeah, more grim trade environment, um, the EU could could be forced to make concessions um, in in direction of the US, especially. Uh, as long as the threat um, of tariffs on the car industry are still in place. The car industry has been spared for the moment, but uh, should that uh, become a more immediate threat, then I think it would, it would uh, be, be put a high, very high pressure on the um, EU and the Commission to act. Thanks. Uh, Alessa, do you want to add up on this or do you, we can go to the next question? by Christy Renner. Are any set citizen groups leading efforts on what specifically to say and ask for from our members of Congress in the United States? Um, not my knowledge, but I would like to uh, um, point you to our next webinar next week where we have um, also Sharon Treat as a guest speaker who's working with the uh, American Institute for, for Agriculture and Trade Policy and uh, uh, will also also bring in the US perspective. So that that's a, that's a good point because actually now it's Sharon Treat asking a question to you 
<laughs> she she says some observers have said these negotiations are really just a way for the EU to buy time to avoid Trump's proposed tariffs on European autos until after the next US election. What do you think? Is the EU serious about having a deal? Um, Alessa, I would just answer that or do you have a... Um, I mean, I would say that the EU always wanted a TTIP deal. <laughs> and I think there are differences between the member states, how much they want it. I mean, Germany really wants a deal between the EU and US. And they also said it will be one of their top priorities for their EU presidency that will start um, in July, that they want to push forward for the negotiations. And um, so I would say, yeah, the EU wants it, but there are differences between the member states, how much. <laughs> and what, what they would give, what they are uh, ready to, to give for it. Yeah, completely agreed with Alessa. I would also um, um, say that the, the, the EU's interest in, in an agreement with, uh, with the US is as high as coming from the US. Um, and the, the two parties are still for each other their largest trading partner and only to have, have tariffs gone and that trade partnership would be a huge, um, huge yeah, advantage for, for increased trade at least. Um, and yeah, also there are some, some other subjects that the EU wants, wants to see concessions from the US. So I think the interest is vivid and there, but at the moment, um, I think especially with, with uh, the dispute over whether agriculture should be in there or not, um, it's not, I mean, a, a TTIP is not to be feared for the next month or so. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we we have uh, one more open question and I think afterwards we will also close the session. Uh, before the, I, I pose the question to the speakers, uh, there's a recommendation by Eva Desevry uh, from Arbeiterkammer, I think. She recommends um, uh, Kenneth Haas assessment of regulatory cooperation and conformity assessment with, between the EU and the US. Um, you, by the way, next week you can hear me, more from Kenneth's side um, on what lobbyists and regulators have in store for us, and especially lobbyists uh, with respect to US-EU negotiations. So thanks for the recommendation, Eva. And now there's Tom Kuchatz. Yeah, I, I hope I pronounce, pronounce it correctly. Um, Thanks for all your work and uh, those trade policy issues. Do we know anything or are there documents and regulatory cooperation in, in EU, UK post-Brexit trade negotiation? What is the role of the EU Council in regulatory cooperation? Is the Trade Policy Committee involved in the different Rec Corp negotiations? Are there, it's a, I think there are many questions actually in there. I don't know. Can the other speakers see them too? Because that's... Yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe you can have a go at Tom's questions. Thanks for posing them. And uh, yeah, please be brief. We have four more minutes to go. Maybe I think with, with, with Brexit, uh, it's foreseen uh, at least by the financial sector, but I'm not, uh, it's not my area of expertise. Um, the Trade Policy Committee would be involved in the negotiating mandates, I would say, that are passed to the Commission, um, but not so much in any regulatory cooperation negotiations or activities themselves. Um, I think there are a lot of differences and conflicts between the member states, um, which is why the mandates came out as thinly as they did in the end. Um, and I know that inter members themselves have been complaining that they don't know what's going on in the talks and that um, they were very surprised, as, for example, by remarks by uh, Phil Hogan about agriculture and uh, other stuff. Alessa, anything to add? Okay. <laughs> Then I think we are about to close this first part of our 
webinar on TTIP 2.0 and regulatory cooperation. Thanks to all participants. Thanks for attending. Thanks uh, uh, for posing your questions. And thanks especially to the speakers uh, and their great inputs on threats to democracy um, via regulatory cooperation. Um, just to point this out again, there will be a second part of this webinar taking place next week on lobby attacks on protection levels. Um, on, and this uh, session will take place uh, at the same time as this week uh, at 5 p.m. Central European time on the May the 27th. And our speakers will be Kenneth Ha and Sharon Treat. Kenneth Ha from Corporate Europe Observatory and uh, Sharon Treat from the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Also, thanks very much from my side. Um, and uh, uh, great to have you all there. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Max.